This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Hello everyone. Good evening. <laughs> and welcome to Senate House on behalf of the Oral History Society and the Institute of Historical Research Joint Seminars. Um, I'm Mary Stewart, I'm one of the curators of oral history at the British Library and I'm also a trustee of the Society. So it's great to see you all here. Um, hoping that we're not starting too early and there won't be a sudden flurry of people to the door. Um, a few things um, before we start and listen to our great speaker, Paul Merchant. Um, if you're not a member of the Society, I'd highly encourage you to be so. We've got some nice leaflets here. You get two fabulous journals a year and discounted rates on our conferences and also on our training programme, so that's great. Um, we have a few things coming up that might be of particular relevance to this audience. Um, we have a um, regional network of oral historians based around the country and we meet every year as a group and at the end of that meeting we have a kind of more public forum for people to come along and think about oral history. So that's on Saturday the 15th of um, November here at the British Library uh, just down the road in London um, and from 12.30 onwards people will be reflecting on remembering um, this the First World War through secondary accounts of memory and also listening to to any archived oral history that may be there and available in the archives. Um, so please come along to that. Um, we also have a really good course called a follow-up course as part of our training programme and it's still taking bookings for the 12th of December. And that's for people who've done five or more interviews and want to think about their interviewing practice in depth, um, listening back to clips and sharing experiences with other people doing oral history around the country. So that's on the 12th of December. And finally, um, the Oral History Society conference next year is um, at Royal Holloway University on the 10th and 11th of July, and that's on oral histories of science, te technology and medicine. So that should be really interest in of interest to anyone who's come here, particularly for the science aspect of Paul's talk. Um, the call for papers is open until the 1st of December, and that's available on the website too. Um, so that's enough boring stuff from me, though I hope to see some of you at those events. And I'm really delighted to, inter to introduce my colleague, Paul Merchant, um, who's uh, got a background in cultural geography and since 2009 has been working with National Life Stories at the British Library on our big project, An Oral History of British Science. And here's some lovely postcards about our great website, so come and have a look at it and listen to lots of stories on the website. Um, and now Paul is still working with National Life Stories, but in conjunction with the University of Coventry on a new um, project looking, it's just started last month, looking at public debates on the relationships between science and religion and if there's a kind of conflict, an inherent conflict there between those two or perhaps not. So um, hopefully we'll be able to bring Paul back in a couple of years and see what he's got to say on that matter. But I pass over to Paul to um, play you clips and think about scientists' childhoods. In the, um, in the introduction to a, a collection of autobiographical essays written by academic geographers, Anne Buttimer considers the role of childhood in the making of geographers, and she writes, For most of the authors in this volume, the appeal of sensory perception, effective bonds to place and region, as well as imaginary experiences gleaned from storybooks, stamp collecting and musing on maps, all contributed to their choice of geography. The cultivation of this geographical sense, which I call choreographic awareness, may have roots in childhood experiences of places events and people. And then, as if taking his cue from her, one of the contributors, um, historical geographer Bill Mead, provides an account of formative childhood walks and pony drives in Buckinghamshire. By the age of four, I was taking long walks with my father, sometimes following the escarpment of the Chiltern Hills, where chalk pits would be explored and where flint stones were gathered in order to strike sparks, sometimes to the margins of the Karelian limestone country, where I never ceased to be excited by the foot-wide ammonites built into a parkland wall. Here we see, fully developed, the assumption which is widely repeated across autobiography and biography, obituary writing and oral history, that it's possible to identify a number of childhood experiences that were formative in the production of an adult self. So with an astonishing jolt, if you don't mind, let's go from historical geographer Bill Mead to John Paul Sartre, who, through, through, through a character in his novel Nausea, observes, Days are tacked on to days without rhyme or reason. It's an endless, monotonous addition. That's living. But when you tell about life, everything changes. Only it's a change nobody notices. You appear to begin at the beginning, and in fact you've begun at the end. It's there, invisible and present. 
and it's the end which gives these few words the pomp and value of a beginning. So from Sartre to Guy and geochemist James Lovelock, whose biographer reports, what he now recalls as the most important event from his time in Letchworth came at Christmas in 1923 when his father gave him a box of electrical bits and pieces, a torch bulb, wires, batteries, electric bell and so on. The experiments he carried out with that box of, with that box of bits were, he is convinced, what led Lovelock into a life of science. And finally, in this brief introduction, um, from Lovelock to me, this is my school book. Um, <coughs> I was nine when I um, produced this. It's entitled My Own Interests. Um, and it's, it's entirely devoted to very dry descriptions and sort of trace drawings of birds. Now, if I'd become an, an ornithologist, this could, this could easily gain, in Sartre's phrase, the pomp and value of, of a beginning. But um, I didn't, as you've heard. I, in fact, became a cultural geographer, a sort of failed teacher, a landscape gardener, and now an um, oral historian. So, since... 2009, I've been researching and conducting long, by long, 8 to 25 hour long, whole life story interviews with British science, scientists for an oral history of British science. And the interviews contain accounts of building radios, playing with chemistry and electrical sets, constructing with Meccano, visiting science museums, natural history walks with parents, watching trains. In most cases, these experiences are presented as having contributed to the formation of a scientific self. For example, the geologist Stephen Morbath. Geology, of course, was not a, not known as a subject, but um, I remember my father, when he came, before he was taken to the camp, right very early on, we used to go along Brighton Beach and look at the pebbles on the beach and my father, for some reason, was keen on fossils, amateur, and we picked out pebbles on Brighton Beach, you know, Brighton Beach is all the stuff that comes off the South Downs and so on, so you get a lot of fossils in the pebbles, and we used to collect these, and then, already in Brighton, when I was only uh, 11 and, and so, I used to sit in the library, the public library in Brighton, looking at, and looking at big books about um, geology. I mean, they were sort of encyclopedia type, and there were pictures of dinosaurs and um, fossil man, Neanderthal man, and they talked about evolution uh, and. Um, so, and volcanoes and minerals. And I got really turned on by geology. I think I got myself a picture of observation and fact and observation and science already in those early days. I've often thought about this. How did I get this? Well, that's what it was. In a similar way, John Kingdom, <coughs> author of the new naturalist book Climate and Weather, feels that childhood experiences explain um, his career in historical meteorology. And in those days, it was very rare to go to university, so the, the main thing was to get a job when you pass your school certificate. And there's a, a notice on the school notice board for um, people, um, they wanted people to become uh, weather meteorological assistants in the metaverse. So I thought, well, I was always interested in the weather, so I applied for that position. Um, going back, my father, being a countryman, had always been interested in weather, and uh, I, I suppose I, you know, I caught that from him as well, having an interest in looking at the sky and the clouds. And um, this, this memory that he has of a childhood, childhood interest in clouds is supported by the discovery in his loft of a, a drawing book, which he brought out for me, containing a coloured pencil sketch of the clouds above the family home in Faversham, uh, dated 1945. But we need to be very careful in simply accepting these and other accounts of the origin of scientific self in childhood. This drawing appears in, a, in quite a large book uh, on one page. Um, the whole drawing book is filled with lots of other drawings, including sketches of buildings, politicians, criminals and celebrities. <laughs> and um, Stephen Morbath's walk on Brighton Beach appeared midway through a, a childhood that includes 
interest in music and language, a narrow escape on Crystal Nacht, emigration to Britain, and friendship with the comedian Ronnie Barker. So in the context of actual complicated childhoods, these lines back to pebbles and drawings of clouds seem rather too neat. What is actually going on in these accounts, I'm going to argue, have argued, um, is suggested by another example. Dan McKenzie here um, co-wrote what many regard as the first scientific paper on plate tectonics. Um, in 1967, plate tectonics describes the relative movement of the rigid plates on the Earth. And his, luckily for us, his mother was the author Nan Fairbrother, and two of her books, one Children in the House, 1954, and another The Cheerful Day, 1960, describe in detail Dan's childhood in the Buckinghamshire countryside and later in London. In the first book, Children in the House, Dan's four years old, and is described by his mother in this book as thoughtful, fastidious, cautious, unsure in relation to a carefree younger brother. I asked him about his own reading of this book, and you'll notice that he's very keen to cut rather than make links back to this particular version of his childhood self. I think I was frankly embarrassed by quite a lot of it, um, because I it, it must be just I must have read it just about the time that I start that I actually uh, took off right. And it was, I mean, parts of it sh show me absolutely as I remember myself at that stage of, of, of being uncertain about, you know, my human relations with other people, not knowing when I was going to get laughed at and this sort of thing. Um, and really, most of that fell away once I became, you know, with, with puberty, really. And he elaborates on this change? Um, there's one thing I haven't said which I should say, which is that uh, as, as a child up until really I was 13 or 14, I didn't do well at school, I was, was frightened and nervous uh, and couldn't understand a lot of what was going on and, and didn't flourish at all. I have these clear memories of, of, of being totally miserable. And this continued until about, uh, I think it was my second year at Westminster. And that coincided, and I don't know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, with, with puberty and with me starting to do science. And I, I mean, I, I, I changed very rapidly, it must have been probably within a year or two, uh, to, to being like I am now, basically, um, both physically and mentally. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I could do maths, physics, chemistry, and particularly chemistry. It just, I, I just be became a basically a different person. So in the second of the books, of his mother's books, which is um, The Cheerful Day, Dan is between seven and 16, so um, it includes this, the time after this change that he described. And within this book, there are accounts of Dan's visits to the, the Natural His History Museum. And his mother writes, he explores with vivid delight this new realm of the mind, finding his own way about the logical country of scientific method. It's as if dumb till now, he had suddenly been given a language to think in to explain his pleasure in the world about him. The theories I puzzle to understand are for Peter, that was the name she gave him in this, are for Peter self-evident demonstrations. He's quick and confident as he's never been before. And we also hear in the book a young teenage Dan speaking of his preference for science. Um, he's, he's quoted by his mother. Today was practical art and I can't stand it. Practical art means drawing your own pictures and I can't possibly draw anything except science experiments, so I skip it whenever I can. And we discussed this second book. And do you remember your impressions of reading it, your feelings? Yes, I, 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 I rather liked it, actually. I liked, I liked it more than, than, than her, her first book. Um, yeah. Why? Uh, 
I suppose it was, I mean, it much, it, it, it more, was more high, rem I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's when my, my brother and I were, were, were much older, um, and I was, I'd become much more at ease with the world at Westminster. Um, and that comes through in the book, I think. Um, and that, that book is much more about me as I now am. I w wouldn't have said I'd changed an awful lot, actually. I'm sure I have to people who, who are looking at me from the outside, but it does my feelings about things. Not, I mean, you know, I, I, that, that's, that's much more how I am now than, than, than the first book. What do you see in it that's, that is like you are now? So when you're thinking of the things that are the same... Oh, you. my interests, my attitudes, you know. The, you know, it, it just... You know, I, I don't have any sort of, if you like, friction with it. I mean, you know, the, the, it's much more like I am now. So. It's much more like I am now. Another example of a scientist recognising his present self in a mother's account of himself as a child um, occurs in my interview with a mathematician called Michael McIntyre. Um, in 1989, his mother, this was again quite lucky, his mother was interviewed by a family friend, and the interview was reproduced for the family in a sort of hardback folder which Michael had kept. And the section Children contains descriptions of Michael as a child, including, I remember Michael's childhood well, he was the first. There were so many incidents that were memorable like the first time he corrected me for a loose and inaccurate use of words. Ma <laughs> Margaret, Margaret was in a playpen, so he would have had to have been between three and four. My mother-in-law's cat walked into the playpen and out the other side. I said, Michael, look at Pickles walking through the bars. And he didn't look up from what he was doing, and he said, through the holes, you mean? <laughs> it, and in my interview with him, this is the crucial thing, that he, in response to the question, what did you do with your mother? This is before I knew about this um, uh, interview with his mother. He refers to this description. He says, the other thing I remember about my mother was that she was interested in our development. And one thing I remember her saying, and I think she even put this down in a little notebook she wrote. At one point, she made a little book with some photos in it and her thoughts on this and that. She called it Anne's book. And one thing, it had a little story about me as a kid. There was a playpen. Heavens, was I small enough? No, the playpen was probably my sister's playpen, I suspect. Anyway, there was a playpen and there was a cat who went into it and my mother said, oh look, so-and-so, the cat has just gone through the bars. And I immediately said, apparently, you mean between the bars. So at that age, I was already interested in precision and the use of words, which is perhaps a bit unusual, and I've had a fetish about this all my life, as you know. <laughs> so here, Michael McIntyre recognises in this particular representation of himself as a child, himself as he is now. This idea of likeness, of correspondence between past and present selves, um, might help us to listen to scientist stories of themselves as children better. Um, I don't think that Stephen Warbath became a geologist on Brighton Beach or in his library. doesn't mean I don't think the walk happened. I think that Stephen recognises a particular kind of self-understanding as scientist in the image of a boy picking up fossil samples and turning revelatory pages in um, encyclopaedia. And he finds himself in other places too. Um, for example, he recognised very recent, his most recent fascinations and interests in the mind of his boyhood self watching films in the 1940s. I was always very interested in science fiction and even during the war. Um, you know, one saw the first films that had been made like um, War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Um, I can't remember the best, my favourite one. Yes, I think it was called Things to Come. It was a great film. I saw these films over and over again in the old cinema flea pit in Water Street where we still go nearly every week. Um, it's modernised now. Um, and these films really fascinated me and some of those mentioned about history of the earth, not many, but the whole concept of um, different worlds, different worlds on different planets, uh, the earth as it was at one time, long before humanity, these are always things that have interested me greatly 
and that probably uh, helped to shape my whole interest towards this subject, just as now I'm still as interested as ever, and we got some interesting results this week from Canada. Um, going back further and further to the earliest history of the Earth, where there's still a great gap of to almost total lack of understanding between the formation of the Earth and the formation of the oldest known geological terrain or rocks. But it still interests me as much as ever, because you, you get a visualization of the Earth and the universe and of life as it's in a completely different time. And last week, for example, uh, Pauline and I went to a day school here in Oxford on the, um, what was it called now? Here we are. <coughs> Early Modern Humans, the Emergence of Cultural and Symbolic Behaviour. That was a fantastic uh, programme. In, in a similar way, I don't think it's sensible to accept that John Kington became a meteorologist through discussions of weather law with his farmer father or through sky drawing. He simply recognises himself in an image of a boy at a window looking up, colouring the sky. Indeed, clouds in particular allow him to construct in this next clip a sense of self that runs in a recognisable way from school days through higher education to what he did that morning. And why cloud study as your choice for research rather than any other aspect of the atmosphere? Well, I think that goes way back, you know, to boyhood uh, school days when I had always been interested in clouds. I think I showed you that uh, picture I, I drew at Haversham before I started taking photographs. But once I had the camera, then of course that took over. And uh, any interesting features of the sky, I snapped. So this obviously had been a very important, as it is, I mean, every day I look out, first thing I do is look out the window and see what the sky is that, uh, um, appearing. So that what naturally was the topic I took up. And if he looks at the sky first thing every morning, then we might argue that far from already formed in childhood, this scientific self is, is constantly um, performed or asserted. It's renewed daily. Now, recent work um, recording life stories of scientists with ethnic minority heritage whose careers began in the 80s and 90s rather than the 50s and 60s, like the previous group, seems to confirm the arguments I've made that scientists tend to speak about their childhoods in ways that find correspondence between present and past selves, with this correspondence being offered as evidence um, of influence or formation or origin. Pharmacologist Mar Hussein Gambles here um, said the following in the first few minutes of her interview in response to a question not about childhood at all or about herself, but about the life of her father. Could you start then by saying when and where you were born? Right, I was born in, in Pakistan uh, in 1968. And can you tell me as much as you know um, about the life of your father? Um, this can be the things that he told you or things that you observed. Right, I was actually brought up by my grandparents. Uh, Mum and Dad were travelling. Um, and my grandfather was a retired army general from Afghanistan, so I'm actually from Af Af Afghan origin. Um, and, and I studied in, in a school in, in Pakistan, uh, you know, primary school. Um, what was home like? Um, I, there wasn't really much science at home. My dad's a doctor, uh, my mum is a housewife. My uncle's a pilot, so yes, there was a bit of science. I was fascinated by, by him. My other uncle was like a TV producer, so there's more arts than um, science in the house. But I was, I just remember, I was just totally nosy. When I was born a nosy child, you know, I wanted to know about everything all the time. And uh, I remember once um, my uncle. Uh, he, was from, he was in America, he brought me this watch, I don't know if you remember those digital watches, they, when they first came out, they used to have a red surface and you used to push a button and red LED. So he got me one of those, it must have been quite expensive in those days. And I just took it apart and I used the red 
space or the lens and I used to look at the sun, you know, and, and I don't know, I, used, I was very young then, I used to plot the sun and into astronomy. Um, I, I don't know where I got that. I was very much into Star Trek as well and, and I've got some old pictures, black and white pictures, I had a small black and white camera. I used to get my dress, my brother dressed, I was Mr. I was Captain Kirk, of course. My brother was um, Bones and we had a neighbour's boy, he, had, uh, he was quite oriental looking, so he was Mr. Spock, you know. So we used to play games like that. So um, I don't know where the influence came from, maybe from watching TV and Star Trek, but uh, that's what childhood was like. That's what childhood was like. There you are, that's what it was like. Um, one, one, of the, one of the advantages of um, um, long oral history interviews is that you go back, you keep going back to the, um, the same person and you can sort of badger them to dig out photograph albums and she did find these photos. One was actually tucked behind some other ones so she didn't even know one of these existed. She talked about them as being black and white. They, look, they don't look like they are in a way but then if you look closely at them, she's, she, as a child she's coloured these with a felt tip. Um, and, el and elsewhere in the interview, she links her most recent interests. She's sort of moved into what might be called unkindly pseudoscience, and uh, she's linked. Um, she links her most recent interest in energy medicine um, to the gadgets that uh, the medical officer Bones used to sort of heal people remotely, just by sort of passing it over them, and the bullet wound would disappear. Another example from this latest group of interviews with younger scientists is. Um, um, Maggie Adair and Pocock, who's um, a space scientist and she now co-presents the sky at night. And in this clip she um, explains her interest in space. And also, um, um, I still had dreams of getting, one of, them, one of my dreams has always been to get into space. And that started, I think, when I was three years old and watching the clangers. And um, in quite a few of the schools I was at, um, there weren't many black kids. <laughs> and so, you know, you sort of hear, um, I never say that I was English, so um, uh, uh, I'd say no, I'm Nigerian, uh, because if I said I was English, I was like, you don't belong here. You're not, you're not English. You're not like us. So I, I definitely said I wasn't English, but I'd say I was Nigerian. But the problem is with being Nigerian, I'd meet my relatives and I didn't speak the language. I'd never been there. So you're a lost Nigerian, they'd say. So I was a lost Nigerian and I wasn't English. So what was I? And I think space puts that all into perspective space you see a globe you don't see different countries you don't see borders you just see everybody and, and star trek because <laughs> star trek was a sort of group of people from all over the world working together and traveling through space so to me that's what broke the barriers down when you're in space you're not you're not a lost nigerian you, you, you it's not that you, you don't belong here you're just a member of the human race and that's what counts now, with the clangers, I think that happened before all that, for, for the formation of those ideas. But the clangers are just so sweet. And I think I was quite an emotional um, uh, emotional child and quite uh, emphatic, a, a, a sort of a, um, empathy with other things. And I thought they were so sweet. And I wanted to go and visit them. So I think when I was two or three years old, I decided that I wanted to go and visit the clangers. And, um, and you see, it sounds crazy, but at that time, people, I'd hear about you know, people going to the moon. And so you have people going out into space, you know, to the moon, I want to go and visit the climate. It's just like a natural progression. So I think with that and Star Trek and those sort of ideas and not quite belonging anywhere, space just had a real appeal. So you have ethnic difference and anxiety, imagine space travel. Star Trek, the clang was assembled in a neatish hole, later neatened up further for a follow-up Royal Society video, which is what I'll <coughs> end with. People often ask me, you're a black dyslexic kid from a broken home in London, how come you're so interested in space? And I think it's because of a number of things. The first one is the clangers. Um, I fell in love with the clangers when I was probably about three years old, and they live out in space, and I, saw, I wanted to go and visit them. And also, at the time I was growing up, uh, people had just landed on the moon, and uh, a space race was going on, so it's in the news all the time. So um, there was an attraction there. But I'm looking um, further, uh, as I was growing up, um, I think being uh, a black kid in London, London is very multicultural, but when I went to school, I often felt I didn't really fit in. I wasn't, um, I wasn't really a proper Nigerian because I've never been there. And my relatives were saying, Maggie, you're a lost Nigerian. Uh, but when I went to school, um, I, if I said I was British or English, I'd say, you're not British, you're black. And so I felt I didn't really fit into either camps. And space was that wonderful thing that transcended all of that because 
when you look at the planet Earth from space, there were no countries, there were no boundaries, we're just one people. And there were also wonderful programs like Star Trek, where people from lots of different countries were all battling the aliens, and I really fancied that. <laughs> all my life. Now, we've got just a, a couple of minutes um, to consider how terrible it might be if, if there was this very direct and simple relationship between um, childhood experience and future self. F for me, um, I was leaping, leaping through one, another one of my books, which I've called General Work, and, and it includes a, a number of comments on myself. Now, uh, where is it? Um, I, su I suppose I am better than most people. Um, what else? S stop kicking the kitten, you'll kill it. Um, and then some rather disturbing sort of drawings of people with sort of semi triangular pe uh, faces, a, a man with a, what looks like a pair of breasts on his head. So it's probably just as well, I think, um, that, that it's more complicated than that. Hang on. <laughs> Maybe it shows why you became an archivist of sorts. Well, I think you're right, actually. Which throws, that throws yeah. the whole thing out. Careful, careful. careful. <laughs> Fabulous, thank you very much, Paul. We've got.